it's a little gray. I think we're all adjusting to the weather change and this gray morning. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We're going to dive into the word this morning, and we're in our second week on this journey through the book of Galatians. Um, and this is uh, the second week, and if you boiled really Galatians down, and Mark hit on this last week, into one word, it would really center on the gospel. That's what we're going to be unpacking this morning. Galatians really centers on the gospel. And uh, this passage that was read this morning, and I was just kind of giggling to myself as Rachel was reading it, because there are so many uh, famous passages of Scripture, and we hear them used at, you know, weddings, and we see them framed on walls and on greeting cards, but there aren't any verses in this chunk of Scripture that will be used that way, right? For example, you'll never see, like, verse 3, Yet, not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Like, that will never be cross-stitched on a pillow. (laughs) Never. Um, And can we just, like, mention for a second that we had a middle schooler stand up here and read scripture, who we've asked many adults to do and they wouldn't do, but she had to read the word circumcision in front of y'all. Like, that deserves a round of applause from us. Um, Way to go. Rachel serving our community well. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> in fact, you, you start reading this chunk of scripture and you read words like law and circumcision and we read all of these apostles' names that are listed out um, and they talk about the poor and you just know we're just going to take a dive deep into history and culture, but also we dive deep into what it means to really be a follower of Christ. And this morning, friends, I know that we live in such a, a divided culture. And even as I say those words, I don't even think I should use the word divided because it sounds like we're just divided into two parts. I should probably use the word fragmented. We live in a fragmented culture divided by race and class and political party and ethnicity and religions and sports affiliations and parenting worldviews and so on and on and on. And this word from Paul to the Galatians this morning is a word that brings what's most important back into focus. This word from Paul, it sharpens our focus and it brings clarity to the cultural haze that we live in. It gives us a legacy to live into of individuals who have fought for and who have spoken up for what it means to keep the gospel at the center of all that we do. This reminds me of a conversation I had with Annika, who's now 12, um, but when she made a decision to follow Jesus. She was about six years old, and it was late at night. And she said, Mom, I I think I want to decide to follow Jesus. And I was exhausted. And these conversations always happen late at night. Thank you, Diane, for the nod. Yep, as parents, like, always late at night. And Broder was in his crib, jumping up and down. And I remember thinking, well, that's nice, honey. But aren't you tired? Like, and maybe that sounds horrible to you, but it also goes to show how crazy tired I was and how when we're tired, we don't always make good decisions. But Annika was persistent because that's how God made her. And so she and I prayed together and she decided to follow Jesus. She told Jesus that uh, how he had died for her and how she makes wrong choices and how she wants to live for him. And it was beautiful. And I I looked at her and I said, Annika, I said, do you know what this makes you? I said, it makes you a Christian. And she said, Mom, I don't want to be one of those. And I thought, well, now I have completely failed, right? And the great thing about being a pastor who is also a parent is then you feel the failure on multiple levels. Now I've failed as a parent, I have failed as a church leader, but she patted my hand and said, Mom, I don't want to be a Christian because I can't even remember all the things that go with that word. I just want to follow Jesus. Friends, the invitation for us as we look at Paul's ministry in Galatians is to examine all the things that we've put on Christianity that have made it a religion and not a relationship. 
And Paul invites us to just strip that all away and remember that at the heart of who we are, at the heart of what we do, and at the heart of all we hope for in the lives of other people is this desire to follow Jesus. And so Mark got us started last week thinking about Galatians and understanding that at the crux of things for Paul was the spirit of protecting and stewarding the message of the gospel. And he used this phrase, don't mess with the gospel. And this is a really important phrase because I don't think in this time and in this place we fully understand how new this thinking was and how invested the church leaders and the apostles were in shaping and protecting the message they were entrusted with. And yet in this time and place, things had started to be added to the gospel that weren't really the gospel at all. What Paul is arguing here is that whenever you add something to the gospel, it doesn't mean that it's the gospel plus whatever you add to it, but it ceases to be the gospel at all. This is why in chapter 1, Paul writes in verse 6 through 7, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. This was the work of the apostles to continue the work of proclaiming the gospel and making it known in their particular cultural context. And for us this morning, Paul is a great example of grace, the grace of God at work. He's a great example of the grace of God at work. He's a case study for grace because on one hand, he was far more religious than any of us. And at the same time, he was far more evil and violent than probably any of us. Because friends, there are two ways to run from God. There are two ways to run from God. On one hand, running from God looks like keeping all the rules so you don't have to have a relationship. And the other way is to just break all the rules. And so Paul was the epitome of both of these ends of the spectrum. He was the extreme on each end, which means for those of us who are here this morning, And we just think, you know, I was walking into church this morning and I have all the Christian bumper stickers on my car. I was listening to KTIS. I am just in the zone. I've got my own Bible. Like, here we go. Paul is like, I have got you beat. He was known for his commitment to the faith, for honoring traditions, for doing all of the right and the religious things. And at the same time, he lived a life of oppressing others. He lived a life of violence and murder. And so maybe this morning, you're walking into church and you think, if these people only knew what I was wrapped up in. If you even saw what I was doing last night, if you knew what was on my computer, if you saw my credit card bill, oh man. But friends, Paul has got you beat. And yet in chapter one of Galatians, it says that God was pleased to reveal his son to him. God was pleased to reveal his son to him. He was pleased to show the gospel to him, to give him a new start and a new way of being human in the world. And so the question before us this morning is really to ask, is there a divide between the apostles who walked with Jesus and Jesus taught them this way of living or is the gospel with Paul who says he received the gospel by divine divine appointment directly from God? And so we read in chapter 2, it says this, and Rachel read it so well. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus also. I went in response to a revelation, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. 
I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. And so we read in this text that, like, for 14 years, Paul had been preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews in the ancient world. And Paul is preaching, and it is working. Thousands of people are hearing about how God is not far off and distant, but he is a guy who came near through his son, Jesus, and how each of us are sinners. And yet, even in our sin, God has made provision through his son for things to be made right, through his death and his resurrection. And people are hearing this message, and they are finding freedom. And so would Paul would move into an area and he would preach the gospel and people would respond and he would start a church and then he would raise up leaders and then he would move on to the next town. That's the kind of catalytic leader he was. But something was happening. There was a problem because a small but loud group of Jewish people called the Judaizers had a problem with the gospel that Paul was preaching. They would come in behind Paul into that newly formed church and say, no, 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 no. Like, Paul didn't have it all right. You can't just accept the gospel, but you have to do all these other things too. And this was happening for 14 years. They would say, yes, we believe in the gospel you are preaching. We know what you say is true, but also we believe in God and the law he's given us. The law was to be circumcised, was to keep dietary laws, and you have to do these things too. And for the Jews, these dietary laws and circumcision was about keeping them culturally set apart. Circumcision and the food that they ate was about personal cleanliness was about purity for their people group. And so Paul decides that this small but vocal group is gaining steam, and so he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to meet with the people. I'm going to meet with the leaders. And he makes a strategic decision to take Barnabas with him, who can offer witness of the conversion that's happening to the Gentiles, and because Barnabas is also a Jew... And then he also brings with him Titus, who is like this pork-loving, bacon-eating Greek, right? And I mean, think about it. Like 14 years, Paul has been preaching the gospel. He's been setting up churches. He's been putting up with this tension that has been building. And so he goes to Jerusalem. And I love this. Like, he wasn't summoned He wasn't called. He was like, okay, you have a problem. We're going to deal with it. And so he grabs his people and he heads to Jerusalem and he says, we're going to figure this out once and for all. And so he willingly makes this journey and he meets with the leaders to talk this out. And some theologians say that they fought it out, but I like to think that as church leaders, they were capable of a civil conversation, right? And so Paul and Barnabas and Titus go and they present what they have been sharing. And then we read this part about circumcision. And I was trying to get through the sermon without having to talk about circumcision. Um, But I just couldn't do it because it is that important here. And so here's the thing. If all of the leaders had met and it was agreed on, you know, Paul, you, you just don't have it right. People can hear the gospel but they also need to follow the law. Or not even that. What if Paul had shared what he was preaching and then the apostles were like, you know, we hear what you're saying, but can we just meet in the middle? Like just for the sake of the perception and keeping it like we also know what we're doing. Can we just meet in the middle? We'll give on the dietary laws if you keep with our law the circumcision, right? And Paul was like, no, no. Like, this is not a compromised sort of situation. This is not Jesus plus anything. This is just Jesus, period. And that's why we read in this verse that Titus wasn't compelled to be circumcised because guess what would have happened to Titus? 
My guess is that he would have come limping out of that meeting, right? In fact, I wonder, because Titus knew, like, Paul had recruited him to travel with him to Jerusalem. And so I wonder, Titus knew the conversation they were going to be having. And it made me wonder the whole way if Titus isn't giving Paul kind of a pep talk. Like, you got to stay strong, man. Right? You can't give him an inch because you know what they're going to want to do to us. It kind of brings an interesting tension and theological debate when there's those kinds of implications, right? Enough talk about circumcision for you. Can I move on now? Okay. We read after this, it says in verse 9, This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. The truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Can I just personalize this for you for just a moment? Paul is saying here that the truth of the gospel has been preserved for you. Let that sink in for just a moment. And he wasn't thinking not just collectively as in this nebulous group of people in the future, but Paul is saying that the truth, the reality of Jesus' death and his resurrection has been preserved for you. Because what I know about most people in this room is that you are Gentiles. And this gospel that Paul was given, if he had wavered in any way, might not have been made known to you. The work of the legacy of faith before us has been that they stayed focused on the gospel so that it could ripple out over generations of people that kept their eye on the ball so that others could hear the message. And that at some point, this would ripple out and a group of believers in Roseville would have such a gospel vision for their community that they would one day start a church so that people could come and hear the gospel and you could come and receive the gospel again in your lives and this is what Christian community and the Christian faith is all about. So you might be sitting here this morning and you might feel invisible. Like nobody notices who you are. You go about the business of your day and day in and day out. You wonder where do I fit in this world? Friend, the truth of the gospel is preserved for you today. You might be feeling like you have it all together on the outside. You're looking so good sitting in your church pew. And on the inside, you feel like a mess. Your worry and your anxiety have a hold on your life. The gospel truth has been preserved for you. You might feel like you are a mess. It doesn't seem like anything is going right at this moment. And you look into your future and you don't even know what there is to look forward to. The gospel has been preserved for you. You might be sitting here thinking, I don't even care. I'm more worried about what I'm eating for lunch. After this, <laughs> the gospel has been preserved for you. Friends, it does me good to remember that we come from a legacy of people that have fought to maintain the line of truth that I now get to stand in and have the responsibility to preach and we have the opportunity to live out as the church. It is not gospel plus all the rules, the gospel only when circumstances are right, the gospel plus any of our cultural expectations. It is the gospel plus nothing. The gospel stands on its own. It speaks for itself. It doesn't need any propping up. It has withstood more than we have ever seen. The gospel is for all time, for all people, in all places. The gospel is complete in and of itself. Am I making myself clear? But friends, the Jews were really nervous about what would happen if the Gentiles didn't have the law. In other words, if you remove the law, if you don't have the law, how will people know what to do? In other words, we don't really trust that people apart from the law are going to do the things they should. 
And I want to unpack this just for a minute because this is really, really important. And a fellow pastor, Matt Chandler, had a helpful approach to understanding this. And so I'm going to steal from him just a little bit. And he says this important word, the law was always a diagnosis and not a cure. The law was always a diagnosis and not a cure. So let's just take a step back from that for just a minute and think about like the Ten Commandments for just a moment. So as someone that loves Jesus and decides to follow him, the Ten Commandments gives us a law that says we shouldn't steal. We should honor our parents. We shouldn't have any other gods in our life. We shouldn't commit adultery. It gives us these guidelines about what to do. And they reveal to us kind of where we're at, how things are going in our relationship with God. They aren't meant to take things away from us as much as when we follow them, when we live into them, we experience life the way God designed it. But friends, what the law can never do, what the law can never do is to save me from my inability to keep the law. The law is not a cure. The law is a diagnosis, and it is not the cure. Um, In the month of June, about two and a half years ago, um, Chris and I had been in kind of a two-month process of trying to figure out what was going on with the health of our then three-year-old son, Jacob. And a lot of you know this story and you've journeyed with it, with us through it. Um, But at this point, he just wasn't himself. Um, He wasn't eating right. He was having these episodes where he would describe, um, he would say, Mom, my heart is breaking. And he was losing weight. And we had been to the doctor and we had tried medicine and we had done all the things that you would do for your child. But after a trip to the ER in which we were sent home, we were eating dinner one night and Jacob was just lying on the couch. And I went to check on him and found him unresponsive. And so after an emotional trip in the ambulance and phone calls to friends and several days at the hospital, we discovered that he had a brain tumor that would need to be removed. And friends, it was devastating. Like our smiley, ordinarily healthy boy had a mass in his head that would need to surgically be removed. Which was just a really nice way of saying that they would put an incision in his head, they would cut a hole in his skull, they would scrape out the tumor, and then they would insert titanium plates in order to put all those pieces back together. And I remember after the doctors had left, and it was just Chris and I and Jacob, and he was laying in bed with all of these wires on him in the hospital room, and there was the lit up scan with the tumor on the wall. And I remember sitting in that room, looking at that scan, and just praying it would all go away. And so many of you have been in this position as well. And we look at that image that diagnosed the problem. And it would be be easy to get just so focused on that image and what that image tells us is going on that we forget it is not the cure. It is not the cure. That image on the screen was powerless to save my little boy. And we could send him in for another scan and another, and we could just put all the images up on the screen, and we wouldn't have a cure. We would just have more information. In the same way, the law is the tool that God used and continues to use in our lives to help us understand how we're doing. But the law is powerless to cure us. Whatever issues we're facing, whatever brokenness we're dealing with, whatever addiction has its hold on our lives, no amount of staring at the scan is going to fix things. The cure is found only in Jesus. 
And I think sometimes at the church we fail to embrace, we fail to live into the freedom that is available to us through Jesus because we keep staring at the scan. And friends, Matt Chandler says this, the scan will always tell us that we're sick. The scan will always tell us that all is not well. The scan will always tell us that there is a problem. It will always tell us that we are not good enough. It will always show us that we need healing, but what it won't do is heal us. That can only happen when we come into an encounter with the person and the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. William Barclay, a pastor and author and professor, says this, Jesus Christ did not say, I have a theological system which I would like for you to consider. I have some theories which I would like you to ponder. I have an ethical system I would like you to obey. No, the gospel begins with Jesus Christ saying, come and follow, walk with me. So Paul is having this conversation with the rest of the apostles, and they've really worked this through, right? And it seems like everything at this moment is going well. They are in agreement that the gospel is still the gospel, and it continues to go out to the Gentiles. It does not need anything added to it. And then in verse 6, we read, As for those who were held in high esteem— Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. And I kind of read this and thought, well, Paul, why you got to be like that? I mean, everything was going so well, and it kind of sounds cocky, doesn't it? Like all of these leaders I've just talked to, they didn't add anything. No big deal, Right? But Paul was not knocking or cutting down the other apostles, but instead he's reminding us again that the gospel does not need to be added to. It does not need human intervention. As great as these people might be, it doesn't need them, and he includes himself in that. And so let's wrap this up. He goes on. And he says, on the contrary, they recognize that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me, right? He's connecting the dots here, as an apostle to the Gentiles. James and Cephas and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. And with this right hand of fellowship, the conversation, the fight is over. Scott McKnight in his commentary on Galatians says that this moment is more than a Western handshake. The right hand of fellowship was an official agreement between Paul and the Jerusalem pillars. They verbally, theologically, and now publicly agreed with the Paul's message and his fear of ministry. They publicly announced that they thought God had called Paul to this very task. It could be compared today to an ordination committee's endorsement of a candidate after lengthy questioning and discussion. So this group of people, they recognize that the message Paul is sharing is the true gospel, but they are also paying attention to something that's really, really important, and I want you to hear this. They're realizing their context is different. They're realizing their context is different. And this seems and sounds so simple, but we get this all mixed up in our heads sometimes. We can so easily equate our context, our cultural lens, our values of a certain socioeconomic status. We so easily can attach these things to the gospel. And we live in a world where there are so many things that can be tailored and changed to our individual preferences. And we forget that when we walk into church, while God has given us incredible freedom to create this environment, what is central is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And one of the things that I have been so aware of in recent months is the way that some of my preferences get in the way of other groups of people being able to have a seat at the table. This is one of the reasons I love taking people on mission trips or worshiping together in different cultural contexts. It takes us out of our reality and puts us in a new setting where hopefully we can appreciate the fact that the diagnostic is the same. The cure is the same, but the context is very, very different. One of the ways I saw this in my own life recently was on our last trip to Columbia. Um, I was invited to preach at one of the covenant churches that we had partnered with. And so our missionary friend, Katie Izasa, was going to translate for me. And I was preaching on prayer. Um, And to be honest, it was a sermon that I had already given um, because, yes, pastors do that. And so before I left, I took some time to kind of read through it and to make some changes because of what I had known about Colombian culture and what I knew might not translate as well. And I have to admit, like, I was feeling pretty good. Um, Like, look at me. I'm being culturally mindful and aware. Um, And I did this task, and it wasn't even just like the night before. I was going in prepared and ready. And so the night before, Katie and I had been sharing a room. And she said, hey, do you have your sermon with you? Because I'd love to read through it beforehand to see if any words would be more tricky to translate. And I handed it over to her somewhat smugly thinking, yes, you can read my thoughtfully prepared sermon. Um, I've been in this context like all of twice now, but this makes me incredibly proficient to your culture. And friends, she was so gracious to me. Um, But if her pen had been read, my sermon would have looked bloody. And I just, I had to leave the room. Like I just walked out, and not because I was angry, not because I was hurt, but because I have so much learning to do as I seek to love my brothers and sisters. Because I want to preach well. I want to create spaces where people can come into contact with the gospel and they don't have to jump through all the hoops or figure out the vocabulary and get over being hurt before they can see the gospel we have to present. And this is the work that we get to do together as the church. And the good thing is that we don't have to go very far to do it. And if our recent trip to Columbia is any indication, we have a world that is waiting and watching to see how we will work out some of our current tensions. And by this, I don't mean just political, because it's easy for us to just go there and then put it on the shelf and fail to take any responsibility. But in the church, where will it stand? How will it define itself? Will it be the vehicle of hope and transformation and love that God has given us the position and the authority to do and be in our world? Or will we just toe the line? of our cultural landscape and play out the division and the power dynamics and the systemic brokenness that we see all around us. Friends, this, by the way, is an issue that does not belong to any one church, but it must be the broader influences of churches working together to fulfill our mission in the world. And in Galatians, we see the apostles got this. They got it. They agreed that their message was the same, but that it was going to look different as it went out to different people. And so they agreed. Paul is going to go to the Gentiles. We're going to go to the Jews. But they gave him one last appeal. They knew the gospel would be the same, but on one point, they wanted to make sure that they shared in the effort. And they said this, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. And with these words, it knit together the Christian's identity with caring for the poor, with noticing and providing space for those on the fringe. A gospel life is marked not by thinking what is best for me, but instead what will bring the life of Jesus to the least of these. Friends, it's a radical life. 
It's a counter-cultural life. But the invitation is on the table for you and for me. The invitation that was fought for by Paul and so many others is that you can leave this place with a former life. God's word tells us that we are each new creations. The old is gone, the new is come. This is the gospel reality and the gospel identity that we live into. But the decision are, is ours. Will we choose to live into that and be gospel people or not? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your good word to us, for your word that goes out and is active and living among us. And we pray, God, that it would do its work in our hearts and in our minds, not just today, but in the days to come. God, we thank you that we can rest in your text today and we can um, examine it for the truth that it is and also look at our own lives and um, invite new reflection and transformation to come about. God, I thank you for this community of faith and the way it lives out the truth of your message to the world around.